following is a conversation with the CEO and founder of the Hermitage Fund, which was at one time the largest source of Western capital in Russia and in 1997, the best performing fund in the world. This person is also one of the sharpest thorns in the Russian oligarch's side. He lobbied for a law that authorizes the US government to sanction foreign government officials worldwide who were deemed to be human rights offenders and freeze their assets. This was named the Magnitsky Act after his former lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, who was tortured and murdered in a Russian prison. This is the author of both Red Notice and Freezing Order. The following is a conversation with Bill Browder. In this conversation with Bill, you can expect to hear about some of the following. The unbelievable voucher system and the chaos that ensued in transition from Soviet Union to free market Russia. Bill's experiences before Hermitage, which includes a wonderful anecdote from Mamansk, which is this totally tucked away, arctic, dark, and possibly desolate city in the northwest corner of Russia. Bill also talks a bit about serendipity. Bill also talks about money laundering and the role that it plays in the great city of London. Finally, we get some advice from Bill for what he would do and where he would go were he a 25-year-old man today. So do hang around to the end of the podcast to hear my afterthoughts from recording this with Bill in person, and then as well, my ambition for the podcast, because this podcast took me five hours to make, but it will only take you five seconds to rate and review. Okay, and finally, with no further ado, here is the great and powerful Bill Browder. A quote from the book. I found that to transition from communism to capitalism, the Russian government had decided to give away most of the state's property to the people. The government was going about this in a number of ways, but the most interesting was something called voucher privatization. In this part of the program, the government granted one privatization certificate to every Russian citizen, roughly 150 million people in total. And taken together, these were exchangeable for 30% of nearly all Russian companies. 150 million vouchers multiplied by $20, the market price for vouchers equaled 3 billion. Since these vouchers were exchangeable for roughly 30% of the shares of all Russian companies, this meant that the valuation of the entire Russian economy was $10 billion, which, just for some perspective, is one-sixth the value of Walmart. And to put into further perspective, Russia had 24% of the world's natural gas, 9% of its oil, 6.6% of its steel, among many other things. Yet this incredible trove of resources was trading for a mere 10 billion. Even more astounding, astonishing, was that there was no restrictions on who could purchase these vouchers. I could buy them. Solomon could buy them. Anyone could buy them. If what had happened in Poland was profitable, then this was off the charts. So to start, Bill, I would love to hear you explain Perestroika and the incredible violence and corruption that ensued. Well, so um, first of all, uh, this this was the moment after... um, the Berlin Wall came down. So Cold War, Soviet system, bankruptcy of of the whole, you know, they just couldn't carry on being a controlled economy, etc. Soviet Union falls apart, Russia becomes an independent country, and um, they realize that the state can't subsidize everybody, they can't pay for everybody, it's time to do capitalism. And um, and they wanted the um, people to buy into the capitalism. And so they came up with this idea, which is if you make everybody, give them a little piece of the economy, then, then, uh, uh, you know, then, then everyone will be capitalist. And so that was the, um, that was the idea. And, and then a bunch of crooks came along and said, well, why don't we manipulate it this way and manipulate it that way and do this and do that and do this and do that. And so um, you've just, we've just talked about what happened to 30% of the country. The other 70% was basically put through all sorts of illegal insider schemes so that 22 individuals ended up controlling like 40 some odd percent of the country. Mm. And so it didn't work out the way they intended, but little, little crumbs were falling off the table. Those little crumbs, um, were shares of these companies that the oligarchs didn't control 100% of, they might have controlled 50% of or 70% of or 95% of, but not 100%. And so we ended up in a situation where I could buy these shares 
at a 99.5% discount. And, and from a business perspective, there, it was a very simple trade. If you're mm. buying something at a 99.5% discount, it's either going to go to 100% discount, in, in, case, in that case you lose all your money, but maybe it just goes to like a 95% discount. <laughs> and then you've made like 10 or 15 times your money. Mm. And so, I, you know, very simply, I, I, I said, there's a, let's, let's put a 50% probability on you losing everything and a 50% probability on making 15 times your money. That's a pretty good bet. Mm. And that was the basis for me setting up my investment fund um, and moving to Russia and starting to invest in this newly privatizing economy. Your experiences at the voucher auctions um, are as well, just it seems like from another world. You know, you can't believe that this is actually how the Russian economy is being cut into pieces. Could you explain the system of how a village, one, you know, muscle would gather it and then bigger muscle would gather those smaller packages. Ultimately, you're at these markets. So they give these vouchers to every man, woman and child over the age of 18. Everyone gets a voucher, and um, nobody has any idea. You know, it wasn't like anyone. None of these people went to business school or anything like that, so they didn't know what these vouchers were. Mm. And so, if you're living in in like Siberia, you've got this piece of paper the government has just um, given you. Mm. You don't know it's worth anything. And someone comes along and says, "Listen, I'll give you a bottle, a five dollar bottle of vodka, in exchange for your voucher." You're like, "Well." That's a $5 bottle of vodka that I can drink tonight. I don't know what this piece of paper is worth. So they would exchange the voucher for the vodka. And the, Could you speculate what the voucher might be worth? Well, we know that the vouchers in aggregate were worth $10 billion. Um, so they were, I mean, the voucher was worth $20 in Moscow. So, yeah. so you, you, but, but that, anyway, so $5 in this little village in Siberia and the guy buys five five bottles of vodka, $25. Uh, and then he takes those $5 vouchers mm-hmm. and he drives uh, 190 miles to some larger provincial town. And there's somebody there who's paying $7 for his $5 vouchers. And that's, you know, a lot of money back then. And then the guy from the uh, who's paying $7 drives to a city another 400 kilometers away. And um, he's selling his $7 vouchers for $10. And then uh, the $10 guy is then like getting on a flight and he's accumulated, let's say, 500 of these things. He's getting on a flight to, you know, uh, another regional place um, where he's then selling them for $17. And then the $17 guy takes them to Moscow where they trade for $20. Mm -hmm. And so they trade for $20. And the, and the Moscow voucher market was like something out of Star Wars. I mean, it's just, uh, they, they, I mean, lots of money was trading, you know, vouchers and money was trading hands, but there was no system really. So people would show up um, with guards. If, you're, if you had, a, you know, if you wanted to buy, you know, you could show up with a half a million dollars or a million dollars of cash, mm. in cash. Mm. So you'd show up with your cash and a bunch of guards because, you know, God knows uh, how... Much that, I mean, that was just just the most enormous amount of money. And so you'd show up with your guards and your cash, and then other people would show up there with their guards and their vouchers, because the vouchers were physical certificates. Um, there would be a, like a, a bulletin board, like an electronic bulletin board, like they have in the airports with the things clicking, you know, the, uh, the old clicking thing. And they would put the prices at different tables for selling vouchers for. Yeah. And... Um, and you come to a deal. Let's say you buy half a million dollars worth of vouchers. And so once you've done that, um, then comes the process. Everyone wants to make sure the money is not counterfeit and make sure the vouchers are not counterfeit. <laughs> and then once you've done this trade, you know, then the people who bought the vouchers load the vouchers into their armored car. Mm-hmm. And the people who got the money load their, ar- their money into the armored car and they disperse in, the, in a different direction. So then you've got your vouchers. And what do you do with the vouchers? Well, so the state says, he announces each week, we're going to be selling 13.2% of, of the Luke Oil oil company and 15.2% of the Unified Energy Systems Electricity Company. And, and most Russians have no idea what these things are. Mm. They, they weren't like 
public companies before. People didn't, it, it wasn't like they were sponsoring sports teams. Nobody knew what Luke Oil was. And so if, if a million people showed up with a million vouchers to buy the car company, because everyone knew what, knew what the Autovaz car company was because they had all seen the cars on the streets, mm. but nobody knows what. And so if, if, if a million people show up with a million vouchers, then whatever is being auctioned gets divided up. So you, you don't even know the price of what you're paying for until you, because you don't know how many other people are going to bid for the thing. Mm. And so if only one person shows up with one voucher, they can buy the whole 13% of some oil company for one voucher. And so this created all sorts of weird um, anomalies. Like there was an oil company called Surgut Neftegas, which is located in the middle of Siberia. And Surgut Neftegas didn't want to have anyone buy their, their shares. And so how do you get to Surgut? The only way you can get in, into Surgut was by, by plane. And since the, since the oil company executives effectively controlled the region, they just called up the airport and said, close the, air, close the airspace. So nobody could land in Surgut to buy, uh, buy shares of Surgut and gas because um, the airport was closed. And so there's all these weird anomalies. And so if you were to ask any normal investor from the West to invest in any of these things, they'd say, you're crazy. I don't, you don't know what price is going to be paid. They could close airports. It's all mm -hmm. total chaos. And because of that, no matter what you bid on, everything was cheap. <laughs> Everything and and so the moment that that you actually got your shares, then like literally within a week after you got your shares, which sometimes took like two months after you bid your vouchers, mm. the price would be five or ten times higher. And so it was truly like the wild west. I mean, money fortunes were being made overnight um, in that moment of time. Did the oligarchs come from the voucher system or from the other seventy percent of the economy that you were talking about before backroom deals? So the main way the oligarchs got rich in Russia was something called the loans for share scheme. Mm -hmm. This was truly a ripoff of the Russian state like no other ripoffs. The 90s, right. This was now, this was 1997. So the Russian government um, uh, privatized all these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at the same time, the Russian oligarchs all um, set up banks. And, and they set up these banks and, um, and they got Russian ministries, they got Russian ministers to, to allocate the money of their ministry to the rush to the oligarchs' banks. And this was at a time when inflation was running at, let's say, 200%. And interest rates were 250%. And so the, the oligarchs would go to the ministers, let's say the defense minister, and say, could you put a billion dollars of the defense ministry's money on deposit in my bank, a billion dollars in rubles, but the equivalent. And, um, and the defense minister say, why should I do that? And they say, because well, we're going to put $10 million in a Swiss bank account with your name on it. But we, we need you to put your money on account at our bank with no interest. And the defense minister said, yeah, 10 million in Swiss, that sounds pretty nice. So he puts, they put the 10 million on, the, on account in Switzerland for him. He puts a billion dollars on their uh, in their bank at no interest. They then take the billion dollars and buy Russian government bonds um, with an interest rate of two hundred and fifty percent. Oh my god! And so all of a sudden they're making money like yeah. like they've never made before. So it's they're making. Ma so, so, and then all of a sudden they come up with some weird logic. The government comes up and they say, "We're running out of money." So they put all the, money, the government's money on deposit at these people's banks. We're running out of money. Um, and so we would like these banks to lend us money. Mm. Uh, but just because we know bankers need collateral, we're going to put like 50% of the Yuko Soil Company or 60% of the uh, uh, TNK Oil Company as collateral for these loans because we need the money. Why do they need the money? Because the money is already on deposit at their bank. So they put the money on, uh, they, they borrow the money from these banks. And it wasn't a lot of money. It was like 500 million here, 250 million there. I mean, a lot of money back then, but, but in relative to 50% of an oil company. And then um, the government sort of consciously defaulted. Say, we can't, we're not going to pay you back these loans. And therefore, the oligarchs got these oil companies for like, five, uh, you know, uh, an oil company that's worth, Fifty billion dollars, ultimately fifty billion dollars for five hundred million dollars. Um, and where did they get the five hundred million dollars from? From from the defense ministry that put the money on the on account before. Mm. 
And that's how the oligarchs ended up controlling the economy. And they, of course, they hoovered up the vouchers where they could. But, mm -hmm. but the, the main way in which they got their benefit was through these loans for share um, schemes. And for them to be in the position to do that sort of stuff, did it come at the end of violence or were these just particularly savvy people uh, taking full opportunity, no, taking advantage of the opportunity? Well, so it, um, th there, these were savvy people doing lots of really illegal things to take advantage of the opportunity. First of all, the bribery to get the money in the first place from the banks. And then well, let's say that... that um, uh, the minister, the deputy minister of privatization is, is responsible for one of the companies going for the loan for shares. And they want to make sure that they win the loans for share competition. And so they go to him and say, um, we want to set up the rules for the loans for share competition. And um, the deputy minister of privatization says, well, why should I do that? And they say, because we'll put $5 million in a Swiss bank account in your name. And, and let's just say one of these deputy ministers of privatization um, was honest for some reason. They can say, if you don't do it, um, the, these um, uh, lieutenants in the police department uh, who are on our payroll are going to find a bag of cocaine in the trunk of your car. Mm. And so um, there was a huge disincentive to not being corrupt for these deputy ministers of privatization because they would go to jail if they didn't go along with it. Mm -hmm. And a huge incentive in being corrupt because they get $5 million in their Swiss bank account. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, and, and of course, lots of people died as well. There, there's all sorts of people getting killed for not cooperating with this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so the oligarchs, I would say, you know, pretty much fall into the bucket of, of you know, hardcore criminals, certainly mm -hmm. financial criminals, in some cases, violent criminals. Yeah. So... Total craziness, the Wild West, the, the 90s in Russia. Um, was it the same voucher system and sort of same chicanery happening in the other Soviet states uh, as well? Not, nothing like this ever happened. They had all their own sort of other versions of corruption, mm. but the, the Russian version of corruption was, was the most... Um, spectacular. It was the most spectacular. It involved the most assets... And in a certain way, it was the most chaotic because there were so many different people involved. So you go to Kazakhstan, they had their own version of corruption, but it was all very tightly sealed. There was the president um, and then every one of his relatives. Sure. That, that was it. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, they didn't have to go through all these yeah. permutations and so on. Yeah. Um, it was like a royal family. Mm -hmm. In Russia, it was you know, well distributed. There were 22 oligarchs. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, just to round off the craziness of this time period. I think the anecdote of your experience in Murmansk is just this most incredible one as well for you, this American capitalist who's found his way into one of the darkest recesses of Russia at really what is the most perfect time um, in this circumstance. And so I would ask you to please describe Murmansk and then as well the incredible discovery that you made there. So first of all, Murmansk is located 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle. So it's the most the furthest north population center in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I, it was my very first trip to Russia. Never been to Russia before. This was 1992. I was working at Solomon Brothers. I was in, in the East European Investment Banking Team. And um, uh, we got a very, very low paying assignment to advise the Murmansk trawler fleet on their privatization. And uh, I was the only person interested in Russia at the time. I think we were making a total of fifty thousand dollar advisory fee, which, in the in the to quote the famous supermodel Linda Evangelista, who doesn't get out of bed for less than ten thousand dollars. This is back in the days when ten thousand dollars was a lot of money for a model. Um, uh, investment bankers wouldn't get out of bed for five hundred thousand dollars for an assignment, and here mm -hmm. I was working for fifty thousand dollars. And you were kind of ridiculed as well. People thought you were this weird guy obsessed with Russia. Um, exactly. No one like, knew why I was doing it and what, what, what it was all about. Anyway, so I go to Murmansk. And to get there, you have to fly from London to St. Petersburg, which is like a four and a half hour flight. You get to St. Petersburg in like 7 or 8 p.m. in the evening. And they, they, um, this is Soviet times, and they hadn't like thought about optimizing schedules of airlines and so the connecting flight was at three in the morning you know why at three in the morning anyway so you sit all 
like until three in the morning at, at the airport, and then you connect to Murmansk, and you, I think it's another like two hour flight from St. Petersburg to Murmansk, and you we arrived at this um, the, the the domestic uh, the regular Murmansk airport was closed because there was a hole in the runway and they didn't have money to fill the hole, and so they diverted to a um, a military airport which had been up until like probably the day before restricted, but everything was chaos at that point. So that we, uh, we go to the military airport, we land, and I could see just rows upon rows of, of rusted MiG fighter jets, unairworthy. <laughs> and I, I thought, this is what we were worried about with these, uh, this Cold War? Anyway, so the, the head of the fishing fleet comes to the airport. He um, uh, picks me up at the airport. We drive. Uh, it's quite a long drive this, where this military airport was. It was like an hour and a half. Um, through the sort of tundra of, of, of this sort of Arctic, Arctic region. Because it is, it is the tundra. It's it, it, incredibly I mean, yeah, dark, there, there, cold, there was no, There was nothing there. It was just like bushes, you know, and, and, and you know, tundra. And uh, no trees anywhere in sight. It, it was, um, you know, in these, all these bogs and marshes of, you know, this was actually in the summertime, and so it was just... Um, uh, Mosquitoes everywhere. Um, just not a very pleasant place. So we 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 arrive at the uh, uh, in the town, and he says, "Before we go, uh, before I drop you at your hotel, I'd like you to see one of these ships." And so we go down to the docks, and um, and and there's this enormous vessel. It's like 450 feet long. Um, on the top of the vessel, they catch they have the nets where they catch the fish, and then it goes down to the next level where they separate the fish, and keeps on going down until in the basement of the ship they have canning machines where they put the fish into cans it's like effectively an ocean going factory and I asked the um, uh, the general director of this fishing fleet uh, how much does one of these things cost and he says 20 million dollars new um, how many do you have in your fleet 100 so 20 million times 100 gets you to 2 billion um, and I didn't know the first thing about fishing or ships but I I asked him, how, what's the age of your fleet? He said, seven years. And so I, I thought maybe that makes it half depreciated, so a billion dollars worth of ships. And we had been hired, Solomon Brothers had been hired um, to advise on whether or not the management um, should exercise their right, their, their legitimate right under the privatization program to buy 51% of this um, fleet. And uh, I asked, what, at what price is the government uh, selling 51%? And he said two and a half million dollars. And of course, it was very obvious what should be done then. And that, and I, I thought to myself, what am I doing advising on this stuff? I should be investing, investing in this stuff. Yeah. But there's a very interesting sort of epilogue to the story, which is that uh, I couldn't invest in this fishing fleet because the management bought it up. Mm. But it's a very interesting story, which is that um, uh, accompanying the um, uh, general director was this uh, blonde translator who must have been 30 years younger than him. He was 50. She was 20. And um, she was spoke perfect English. I don't know where she had learned her English. Maybe, you know, KGB Academy or something like that. Very pretty woman. And um, uh, I, I've learned since that um, he left his wife. She became his wife. And through some chicanery, she somehow um, took over the fishing fleet, divorced him, and she's now the owner of this amazingly valuable fishing fleet. Wow. So it really was this time of just if you were... Uh willing to bend the ethical uh, curve to say it in a terribly articulate way but if you were to act, prepared to behave unethically and had lots of ambition someone like this woman for instance or one of the myriad oligarchs or the hundreds of people we haven't heard of but you still have millions of dollars of assets in a you know, country that um, is relatively poor uh, it was this sort of wild west you could just make things happen uh well, so, so, but the disincentive to that is that everyone was killing each other. So people were trying out these things and then dying. Mm. And so there was a whole thing called the aluminum wars in the um, uh, uh, in the aluminum industry. Um, I can't remember the numbers, but it was dozens of executives working for Russian aluminum companies were being assassinated, um, and people were like, you know, sleeping in the factory with machine guns to like protect yeah. themselves. And I mean, it's it, crazy because it, it was chaos. You know, all, all it took was a few. <laughs> Sheets of paper, and somebody could end up becoming a you know multi millionaire, a hundred millionaire, a billionaire. Um, 
but everyone wanted to and 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 people were ready to kill for for like you know a few thousand dollars mm. i mean the, the kinds of things people would be doing for for you know a million dollars or a hundred million dollars is you know unthinkable and in the midst of all of this you decide to start investing in the russian economy how does the thought of your own safety and the violence you're seeing around you how did you or i should ask how much did you think about whether it would affect you or not? Well, um, of course, it was hugely scary. But what, what, what was happening back then was it was chaos. And, and it was really disorganized chaos and disorganized crime. And so, what, the, the, what, so the aluminum, people in the aluminum business were being killed. Bankers were being killed. Um, and people, like if you, if you owned a shop selling... Cartier watches, you know, the mafia would come to your shop because it was visible you had Cartier watches. But nobody knew what was what. And so if you, so I didn't drive around in a, I had like a, I think a Ford Bronco, mm. um, a used Ford Bron- Bronco that I bought, brought in from abroad. Um, I worked out of like a, an anonymous office somewhere and I was just buying shares <clears throat> anonymously from stockbrokers and other in, in other anonymous offices, nobody knew who I was at the very beginning. Mm. And, um, and I had a driver who was a former um, a traffic police officer. He, he, he carried a weapon and, and nobody, you know, in the early days, you know, went from my office to the restaurant, my, my car, to the tennis court, to the home. Those, that was my, my thing. And I, I wasn't like, you know, strolling the street at night with like, um, you know, wearing a suit and, you know, with a, really? So you just managed to stay totally under the radar? And, and, and by staying under the radar, nobody thought of me, heard of me, did anything about me and for, at the very beginning. Sure. At the very beginning. Obviously, things <laughs> took quite a turn. Um, but at the height, the uh, Hermitage Capital was worth $4.5 billion, right? So we started um, managing people's money. I started with $25 million from uh, a man named Edmund Safra. And then we started just gain, gaining profitability and people started adding their money and eventually grew to become a four and a half billion dollars, which may be the largest foreign investor in Russia. Yeah. And a quote from the book, uh, because you have a, a fascinating family who were largely from the left and the hard left in your grandfather's case. Um, quote from the book, after four years in boarding school, you said the biggest rebellion or biggest way you could piss off your family was to put in a suit and tie and become a capitalist. <laughs> And then you end up being the biggest Western source of capital in the former Soviet Union. How did your family think about what you were doing? Um, well, so my grandfather was the head of the Communist Party of America. So he was the full-time communist. I became a full-scale capitalist. Yeah. But he, he passed away when I was nine, so he never saw that. But for when I first started, everybody was very kind of um, kind of bitter about the whole thing. Mm. Um, uh, you know, my, my father was a, a professor at the University of Chicago, a mathematician, very left wing, as, my, my, as was my mother. My, my brother followed my father's footsteps and became a, a physicist. And, and um, uh, my cousins were all like academics or musicians or, or you know, all. And so I, I was really seen to be, a, um, you know, kind of a, you know, it was just really, uh, it, it was, it was, it's, it seemed to everybody in my family as I was doing something that was very um, base. It was a very base existence, um, you know, just, just trying to make money. Yeah. And, uh, and they didn't like it at all. And, and in a certain way, I, I, I kind of enjoyed the fact that everyone didn't like it. So. Right. <laughs> but since then, how have you know, they reconciled it? I, do they view what ultimately ended up happening as a consequence of it being the sort of dirty right capitalist system or do they see sort of beyond the left right lens of it well i mean i think that that my father in particular um uh i mean it's interesting he finally started to think that what i was doing had some some importance um when harvard business school did a case study on the hermitage fund it was all about shareholder activism which i was very involved in and he thought well if harvard thinks, you know, if an academic institution like Harvard thinks it's, it's worthwhile, then it must be something worthwhile. And and by the end of his life, when my first book came out, Red Notice, um, uh, he was actually listening to the audio version over and over again because it gave him some pleasure yeah, in, his, in his dying days. And so, I mean, I think we he finally came to terms that, you know, what I had done with my life was 
meaningful and, and worthwhile. How does it make you feel to think that your dad is so enthralled with the book that he's going on repeat? Well, I, I think, it, I mean, you know, he was, he, he was um, uh, you know, in a very bad way and towards the end of his life. And, and I think, I mean, it was nice that he had, that, that it gave him some comfort when, mm. he was, when he was not well. And mm. so, um, and particularly given that he had sort of early in his robust years sort of so, so much rejected what I was doing. Yeah. Oh, but it just feels like a sort of close circle, you know. Dad's really proud of me. Look at this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we... We were able to um, that, that, that he, when he left the world that he he left on good terms with you know full you know mutual respect and mm -hmm. and love. Uh, yeah. So just to return to the timeline quickly, ninety two you're in Murmansk. You've identified a company potentially worth a billion dollars that's uh, asking two point five million for it. Um, how soon after this are you then um, raising money and putting it to work in the Russian economy? So I, I, after after Murmansk, um, I go to Russia. I go to Moscow to see whether the same thing is going on in Moscow. I didn't know whether it was a fishing mm. situation or, or a, you know, a Murmansk situation, or whether it was something more widespread. And it turns out that they were doing the voucher privatization, which we've just gone through the same math. Yep. I learned that in Moscow, and I came back to Solomon Brothers, like, you know, like a banshee with <laughs> like a knife between my teeth. Like we got to stop everything else we're doing. We got to go and invest all of our money in Russia. And the moment I said that, everyone kind of got crazy and like, what are you talking about? Get, get away from me. You know, nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. And, and uh, the more I talked about it, the more um, people kind of uh, sort of rejected me. And and, um, and I was almost fired because it was just, I just sort of burned my relations with everybody in the firm. And then finally, I got this strange phone call from a very senior person at the top of the hierarchy in New York which is the headquarters, who said, I hear you're having some career problems, but you might have something interesting to say. About, interesting character, too. Might, might have something interesting to say about Russia. So I go to, go to New York, and I sit down with this guy, and he had made a lot of money over a number of years investing the firm's own capital in different markets. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he is very eccentric, um, but because he was so profitable that, that in these at Solomon Brothers at the time, all, all, the only thing that mattered is making money. It didn't matter... You could be nice, mean, weird, anything. But if you made money, you're great. Doesn't matter how good you are, or anything else other than making money. Mm. Um, and so the guy like wore slippers in the office and the same tie every day. It was his lucky tie, and, and had no social graces whatsoever. And um, I sat down and I, I, uh, I started going through my PowerPoint presentation with him, and I'd rehearsed it like 20 times, put the perfect presentation together, and. Um, on page 20 or so without, there was no nodding, no ahying, no questions, just impassively staring at me. <clears throat> and after page 20, he just gets up and leaves the room. And um, he's gone for like 10 minutes and 20 and 30. And I'm like getting more and more agitated trying to think, you know, how, how can I bring this meeting back on track? Because I wasn't, you know, I was going to be fired if I didn't, you know, somehow figure this thing out. And, um, and he eventually comes back like, 50 minutes later, <clears throat> and I'm about to blurt something out to try to get the meeting back on track. But before I have a chance to say anything, he very calmly says, you know, those slides you showed me are the most single most impressive thing I've ever seen in my investment career. I've just gone to the risk management committee of Solomon Brothers, and I got you $25 million to invest. I want you to stop wasting your time doing any of this nonsense you're doing right now and get to work. Go buy the vouchers. Go invest the money. Mm -hmm. And that's when we went and bought vouchers, bought shares. And we put the $25 million to work. And then seven months later, The Economist magazine uh, comes up with an article describing the same math that I've just shared with you yeah. about the vouchers. And all of a sudden, our $25 million portfolio becomes uh, uh, five, goes up 500% and becomes a $125 million portfolio. And all of a sudden, everybody wants to know me on the trading floor of Solomon Brothers. And at that point... Um, uh, all the big investors around the world, George Soros and uh, Julian Robertson and <clears throat> Sir John Templeton all want to meet me. <clears throat> I go and meet all these guys. And um, they're much smarter than my colleagues ever were at Solomon Brothers. And they say, we like it. We want to give you some money to manage. And I say, at the moment, we just manage our own money. But mm -hmm. let me go back and see. I go back to the bosses at Solomon. <clears throat> and I say, um, 
uh, what do we, um, uh, just with Soros, he wants to um, give us some money manage. What do you, what do you think? And um, uh, the guy says, brilliant idea, Bill. Let's form a task force to study it. And I show up at the first task force meeting and there's like 45 people present. There's like the vice chairman of the firm and this, this managing directors and directors and vice presidents. I was the lowest guy on the totem pole. And, um, uh, and a fight breaks out immediately about who's going to get the economic credit for the business. Mm-hmm. And all these different people are arguing for their narrow uh, groups of... Uh, and I, I just... Uh, I had no idea who was going to win the argument, but I knew for sure who wasn't going to get any economic credit. And that was going to be me. Mm-hmm. And so I quit, and that's when I moved to Moscow in 1996, and I set up my fund. Started with $25 million from one of those guys I met on Wall Street, and, um, and eventually grew to become the biggest investment fund in the country. There are so many points in, of uh, incredible serendipity in the story as it's told in Red Notice and uh, Freezing Order. I just want to point out a few. You know, you getting into BCG first after being rejected by all the other big consultancy firms was this sort of moment of luck, moment of serendipity. Someone saw beyond whatever your grades in university was. That gets you to the point where you can meet John Lindqvist at BCG, who is one of the only other guys interested in Eastern Europe. You happen to go to Poland just after the fall of the Berlin Wall. You're in Murmansk making that amazing mathematic calculation seven months before The Economist and the best financial journalists in the world are making it. These are a series of moments that really define you. So I'd just love to ask you if you could reflect on the role that serendipity has played in your life. Well, so um, it, it wasn't luck or, um, I mean, so yeah, I made this decision when I was 17 to be a capitalist <laughs> when, because my family was communist. Yeah. I, I end up... Um, <clears throat> Uh, through a variety of different things, um, doing different things until I ended up at Stanford Business School. And I graduated business school in 1989, which was the year the Berlin Wall came down. And I thought, um, if the Berlin Wall has just come down, my grandfather was the biggest communist in America. Wouldn't, isn't it logical that I, do, I set out to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe? I look for jobs <clears throat> and, and I, I want a job to do Eastern Europe. And there was one guy at one consulting firm in one city in the world. That was this guy, John Lindquist, at the Boston Consulting Group in London. Oh, so you sought him out. I thought it was... No, oh, I saw... Okay. I, 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 I like... You know, they, they wanted me to go... I grew up in Chicago. They wanted... The Boston Consulting Group said... They always like to have, like, indigenous people going back to their <laughs> their hometowns because then they'll, like, be well-liked by their, yeah. you know, whatever clients. And um, <clears throat> so the Chicago office of BCG wanted me to go work in Chicago with... You know, if you're from Dallas, the Dallas, you know, that's how they did things. And so, um, and so I go to Chicago and I say, well, you know, um, I, I want to work on Eastern Europe. And, so, and they really wanted to hire me. And so they said, well, we got this one guy in London who does Eastern Europe, John Lindquist. Why don't we send you over there? And, and if you guys get along, you can go work for him for a year and then come back to Chicago. Mm. So um, <clears throat> I go to London. I meet this guy, John Lindquist. Um, uh, he says, well, we don't have any Eastern European work here at the moment, but why don't you come to London? The moment we have some, you'll be my man. And so I'm, I'm doing, so I come to London. I work on like some, I was doing like going out visiting fax, fax machine salesmen, salespeople in like Birmingham and Manchester. And it's just like, what am I doing? And then one day John Linquist comes and knocks on my door and says, hey, you, you're, you're the guy who wanted to do Eastern Europe. Um, we just got an assignment to advise on this um, failing bus factory in Sanok, Poland. And so they, they, they sent me out to Poland. They're having like food shortages and hyperinflation and phones don't work and there's no heating in the buildings and so on. And I'm working in this failing bus factory. And while I'm in the bus factory, um, my interpreter, uh, um, one day I notice he's carrying around a newspaper with a bunch of financial figures on it. <clears throat> and I said, what are these? financial figures. And he said, these are the very first privatizations. And we sit down at the conference table and we go through the numbers. I said, what's this number? This is the um, <clears throat> number of shares outstanding of this company. What's this number? The share price. Multiply the two. $80 million is the valuation of the company. What's this number? Uh, this is last year's profits. I said, couldn't be. He said, no, last year's profits. 
$160 million. So um, $80 million is the value of the company. <laughs> Last year's profits is $160 million. And so I, I thought, well, that, that sounds really interesting. And so I, um, <clears throat> so I go and buy, I have $2,000 of net worth. I go and spend the $2,000 on shares of this company. And they go up 10 times. And at that point, I knew I didn't want to be a consultant anymore. I wanted to be investing. And that's what led me to Solomon Brothers. <clears throat> I get to Solomon Brothers. <clears throat> nobody was, I was on the East European team. Nobody was doing Russia. Um, and so I volunteer to do this assignment in Murmansk, which is where we get. So it, it, was, it, was, not, um, I, it was not luck. It was, uh, it was directed at this strange place that mm. nobody wanted to get involved in mm. because of this weird family background that I had. <clears throat> I totally missed that it was, I knew your goal was to become a, you know, big bad dirty capitalist, but to be the biggest Western capitalist in Eastern Europe, to have that as a goal at 17, and then to have fulfilled it at, I suppose, 35 or something. Um, it was, it was, um, <clears throat> I mean, it was really, um, I, was, I, I couldn't, I, I didn't really have time to reflect on it while it was happening, because it was like riding a dirt bike on a rough road you just had to hold on for dear life and hope that you didn't get thrown off of it yeah. um, but uh, but it was quite quite extraordinary and really fun when it was first happening it just got unfun later mm -hmm. on freezing orders the definition are a legal means of preventing the sale of any assets and are legally enforceable if not adhered to and also the name of the book is freezing order billions and billions of dollars of corruptible wealth are at the center of all of this can you speak about the role that offshore finance plays in both the second book, but as well just in the, all the corrupt dealings in Russia. So what, what, what I become the largest foreign investor in Russia. <clears throat> and what do I discover? That I own shares of companies, but I don't really have a share of anything. Because the oligarchs who control these companies are stealing money out the back door in ways you can't even imagine. I mean, the, the, the amount of stealing that was going on was just off the charts. Can you give us a sense for it? So Gazprom, for example, the largest gas company in the world, was a non-profit company. It wasn't non-profit because they were going and doing good. It was non-profit because all of the money that they were making selling gas was, was basically being made by friends or family members of the management of the company, not by the company. Huge gas fields, huge gas fields worth $10 billion were being sold for $100,000 to friends and family. Okay. Insane. Unbelievable. Yeah. And so I decided to start challenging the corruption. And interestingly, in Russia, the, the um, information is really easy to come by. There's no data protection in Russia, and there certainly wasn't then. Uh, the guys, it's a, it's a highly bureaucratic country. Everything that's being uh, done in these companies is being uh, data is being collected by four different ministries. The people working at those ministries are paid like thirty dollars a month salary, <clears throat> and so the only way they can survive is by selling the data. And so there's these information markets that have emerged in Russia. Where I, I, if I wanted to know if you were in Russia and I was in Russia, I could and I wanted to like do a little due diligence on you before the meeting. I could find out, um, you know, how much you earn. I could find out you know, the balance of your mm -hmm. bank accounts, where you sent money to, who you call on your mobile phone, what your medical records are. I could find out just anything I wanted, where have you traveled to. It's all free, freely inf available information for five bucks. An incredible detail on that is, as you explained in the book, this is sort of just at the back of a sort of regular old market, right? Just down the <laughs> well, road from the Kremlin. Yeah, there's a place called the Gorbushka, which, um, uh, which has, um, where they sell discs with all this information on it. <laughs> you know, you, you, want, you want to buy a, a you know, a, a pirated DVD of, um, you know, Bruce Willis, you can buy that at the front of the shop or the back of the shop, you can buy a, a information yeah. on, on like everybody's medical records. I mean, it's just insane. Yeah. Um, but so that also offered us an opportunity to figure out who was doing the stealing, how they're doing the stealing. And then I would take this information, we would put to, the one thing I learned at BCG was how to do a great PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and I put it into the great, these great PowerPoint presentations and then I share it with the Wall Street Journal. And they were like, wow, this is pretty cool. You've saved me three months worth of work to, uh, and so they would write up the stories on all the stealing. And um, off the back of that, an interesting thing happened, which is that Putin, who had just come to power, he was fighting with the same guys we were fighting with when he was first president. The oligarchs were more powerful than him. 
and uh, and so and I've never met Vladimir Putin, but he would he would whenever we had publicized one of these scandals, he would step in and try to do something to to the oligarchs, not because he cared so much about honesty and corruption, but because he hated the oligarchs. And there's ex expression, your enemy's enemy is your friend. And so for about three years, I would do, do these naming and shaming campaigns. We'd figure out who was stealing money, where they were stealing, where the money ended up afterwards, offshore, wherever, and, um, and then publicize it. And then Putin would come in and do something about it. And so as a result, um, the value of my portfolio just went through the roof. And um, I thought he was, for the first few years, I thought Putin was a good guy. Mm. But then he, he decided to re arrest the richest oligarch in Russia, a man named Mikhail Hordakovsky, who was the owner of an oil company called Yukos. He arrests him off his private jet in Siberia, puts him on trial, and allows the television cameras to film the richest man in Russia on trial sitting in a cage. Well, the other oligarchs all saw this and, and went to Putin and said, what do we have to do so we don't sit in a cage? He said 50%. And at that point, um, he became the richest man in the world. And at that point, all of my exposés were no longer going after his enemies, but going after his own personal financial interests. And in November of 2005, I was expelled from the country. I was declared a threat to national security. My offices were then raided. Um, and uh, they seized all of my documents. And I hired a young lawyer named Sergei Magnitsky to investigate. And he discovered that the documents were used to steal $230 million of taxes that my firm had paid to the Russian government through a complex scheme. Sergei exposed, he, we thought, Sergei and I thought that, that this, there's no way that, that Putin would have allowed his own officials to steal what wasn't our money, it was tax money that we paid. We thought it just brought it to the attention of the highest authorities, the good guys who get the bad guys. So we uh, wrote criminal complaints to every different, head of every different law enforcement agency. I went to the media, and Sergei then testified against the officials involved. And um, uh, instead of arresting the people who stole the 230 million, they arrest the people who stole the 230 million, arrested Sergei, put him in pretrial detention, where he was then tortured for 358 days and murdered on November 16, 2009. And since his murder, um, I've made it my life's work to go after the people who killed him to make sure they face justice. And as part of that, I wanted to know who got the money. I want to make sure that money gets frozen around the world, mm. frozen and seized by law enforcement. And so I then, for the last uh, almost 13 years, have been on a mission to find the money. Mm. And I've learned more about um, money laundering, uh, offshore finance, um, and, um, and collusion from the West than I could have ever imagined. <clears throat> And basically, what, what has happened is that um, the people who stole this money, and this is just one of many, many crimes, uh, they, um, uh, they laundered the money first through a bunch of Russian banks. And we got all this information from, from Gorbushka or the equivalent. They either laundered the money through a bunch of Russian banks. And then after that, they couldn't send the money directly to London to buy a villa because the banks here wouldn't take money directly from Russia, so they send the money to Cyprus, and then to Latvia or Lithuania or Estonia. Mm. And after it's gone through like you know 15 different accounts in those places, then they'd move it on from those places to Switzerland or London or Paris or New York. And um, over a period of time, we put together the full picture, the whole the org chart of, of where the money went. Mm. And by and and when we did that, um, we then went to law enforcement, and we get. We went to the um, U.S. Department of Justice and the French, uh, the French and the Swiss and the uh, Spanish, and we filed criminal complaints with the uh, law enforcement agencies of those countries. We usually hire a local lawyer who helps us navigate the legal systems, and we get criminal cases open. And those criminal cases, then they have resources far greater than ours in terms of looking into where the money went in the country that we're looking at, and. Mm -hmm. and uh, in some cases, they issued freezing orders, which is the name of my book. In some cases, they actually seized the money. And um, this really upset Putin more than anything because um, this was just, you pull on this thread and it pulls the whole sweater undone. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of finding the money, money laundering, offshore finance, we are sitting 
in what Oliver Bolo would claim is probably the heart of offshore finance and financial secrecy in the world, and that is London. If you look around, there are beautiful buildings, less beautiful buildings. I was wondering if you could um, speculate as to, not speculate, if you could comment on offshore finance, money laundering, and Russian illicit cash that flows throughout this city. So Oliver Bolo is completely right. This is the money laundering capital of the world. More money, dirty money from Russia has come through the UK than any other country. Um, since Vladimir Putin came to power 22 years ago, there's not been a single money laundering or economic crimes prosecution in this country of Russians. Um, and so the Russians view this as, as a hospitable place to launder money. Mm -hmm. And so in order to export dirty money and corruption, you need to import it somewhere else. And there's people all over the city who are specialists in importing, on covering it up. On, mm -hmm. And so there's, there's people helping launder the money. There's lawyers and accountants and bankers doing that. There's lawyers um, helping all Russian oligarchs launder their reputation, suing their journalists um, who say anything about um, uh, the dirty money. Um, there are private investigators going out and digging through the trash of journalists and whistleblowers. Um, and, and they've totally co-opted the system here. And um, for 22 years, uh, this was the most hospitable place. It's become inhospitable since the beginning of the war, but I worry that um, that only applies to Russia. I mean, you know, for Chinese doing the same thing, no, yeah. no problem. The Latin American drug cartels? Everybody. Yeah. This is the place. The illegal organizations can only scale to the heights that they do because of the mechanics of financial opacity and all these myriad bad acting lawyers, bankers, uh, and so forth. That you and, and then the worst part about the whole thing is that you have um, uh, nobody who is prosecuting it. The um, regulators don't regulate. Mm. I mean, there's a huge amount of bureaucracy. If you're, you know, if you're regulated under the financial conduct <clears throat> authority here, you've got to file a million pieces of paper. But it doesn't matter what papers you file. You know, you can send in just like a random number generator <laughs> because they're not looking at the stuff. <laughs> and, and this is what you're running up against every day. And 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 so. You know, as I as I said, we did a, we 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 find money in the country. We file criminal complaints. We expect the law enforcement agencies to open investigations. We did this did it in France, major investigation. Did it in Spain, major investigation. Switzerland, major investigation. United States, major investigation. Britain, nothing. Not a bill. I really could go on for much longer, um, as you know, but we have five minutes left. So I want to close uh, with this question. The fellow I'm staying with here in London, he was shocked when I told him that it was you that I was going to come and uh, meet with because he went over to his bookshelf. He doesn't read many books, <laughs> pulls off red notice. And coincidentally, he's working his way through it right now. And uh, what we both really romanticize most about that book is the time spent early in your career, uh, BCG, uh, Solomon, etc. And not to project too much onto the experience, but it feels like it was this amazing combination of adventure and as well as career ambition being met. So something me and thousands of the listeners will likely feel as well is that you know, hunger to attack the world, but also where, where do I find the great adventure? Well, you know, it's easy to explain in hindsight. So if you were your 25 year old self today, where would you go and what would you do? Well, so if I was my 25 year old self back then, and I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have gone to Russia. <laughs> I would I would have said, so, I mean, the, you know, we haven't had a lot of time to talk about the tragedy and the death threats and all that kind of stuff that have come about, but it's been a total nightmare. Um, but people often ask me, so what is the next, you know, what is the next Russia? Where can you find, you know, hundred baggers like we found in, in, in all that kind of stuff? I'm not suggesting where is the massive upside commercially. I'm more sensing at the adventure and the you know um, just curiosity of a place like you were. Well, so here's the thing. It can be anything. So, I mean, what, what I tell young people who are setting out on their careers is you should um, find something you love and you care about. I mean, it could be you know, accounting for insurance companies. If you love that and you care about it, 
and you can become the best person in the world accounting for insurance companies, you can have a very satisfying life if you, if you love and care about it. And so I had this weird interest in Russia because of my family background. And, and I developed an interest in finance after that. And I combined those two things and I, I just kept at it when, it when there was nothing to do there. So Bill Gates was interested in software long before anyone was interested in software. Mm. I was interested in Russia and Eastern Europe long before anyone ever showed up to do that because I had an interest that was outside the, the realm of economics. And so, and, and the happiest people I know are not the ones who like found the best jobs in places, the, the people who found what they cared about and they loved. And so you can be, it can be anything. I mean, the, the world is full of these minute niches of things that you could be great at. If you, find, if you can find out what, what you care about, I mean, the only thing you need to do in life is just figure out what it is you really care about, what it is you really want to do, what it is that really drives you, because anything could be a great adventure, and even accounting for insurance companies. <laughs> but if you were your 25-year-old self today, looking out, more specifically, I know I, I completely uh, identify with that message. You, know, you can find your happiness and your joy in, in so many different things. But you, now, what would you do? Where would you be? What is the really fascinating thing that you see on the horizon? Well, I mean, I, I see something really terrible on the horizon, which is um, all these excesses of the last 25 years of like too low interest rates and mm -hmm. money being printed and all this kind of stuff. All that's going to got to come out of the system. And afterwards, there's going to be, you know, all, you know it's going to all reset. But while, while, while we're in, the, in this reset moment, when it hasn't reset, you know, you just try to have to keep your head above water, I think. <laughs> well, Bill, on that incredibly optimistic note, thank you so much, mate. Uh, yeah, it's been, it is a thrill to meet you, to be here and to, to do this with you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you again, Bill, uh, for inviting me up to the office, but then as well for being so generous um, with your time. It was quite something to sit across from you and, and, uh, and have this conversation. Uh, you guys should check out the video on YouTube and you can see the setting for the conversation as well. Uh, Bill occupies one of the top floors of uh, a very beautiful building that actually overlooks an even more beautiful building, some very, very old um, building in, in London. Doing this podcast was really a, a long time coming. It was over a year ago that I first listened to Red Notice. And uh, a, a fun little anecdote that came from this book was the guy who I was staying with while I was in London to do this podcast, um, you know, he doesn't read many books. And I, he said, oh, well, who are you interviewing? And I said, oh, this fella, Bill Browder. And he said, no fucking way. And went over to his bookshelf and pulled out Red Notice, which he was uh, reading at uh, that very moment, which is a nice little moment of uh, serendipity. But both um, him and I romanticized really heavily the same point of this sort of young, ambitious Bill who discovered a, an amazing opportunity in the post-Soviet Union economies and really just, you know, orientated himself directly towards it and ended up creating something amazing, which clearly as well, um, as Bill speaks about directly, you know, turned out to be a bit of a nightmare. But... But still, those early days of him in Mamansk, of him in Poland, I uh, definitely projected onto as, a, as, as, as an incredible adventure. Finally, to you, my dear, dear, dear and generous listener. Thank you so much for having tuned into this. If this is the first time that you've heard this podcast, what I tend to uh, do now is just make an appeal for reviews. And the reason why is because the podcast algorithms are really in the stone age. There is not enough categorization for uh, shows like mine to be able to sort of be discoverable. The discoverability of these algorithms is terrible. There relies on a couple of lists, um, but then the rest is all sort of word of mouth. It's very difficult to get organic search into these algorithms and so forth. But my ambition for this podcast is to corner the podcast market for eclectic curiosities, no matter what country it is that you're listening 
in from. So eclectic curiosities, what does that mean? As you can see, this episode is with Bill Browder. The episode last week was with uh, Alexander Richter about geothermal energy. The episode uh, next week is going to be with Martin Schibbe, who spent a year in an Ethiopian prison and is one of Sweden's greatest investigative journalists. There is a wide range of eclectic guests that is just a reflection of my own curiosities who come onto this podcast. And so because of that, uh, it's extra hard to index and to find and to understand within the podcast uh, you know, binary node algorithms. I don't know if that makes any sense. But anyway, please, if you're listening right now, swipe up your phone, pull up Spotify, pull up Apple Podcasts, pull up whatever it is you're listening to this uh, on and leave a juicy, healthy review. Pump that good juice into the algorithm. Five stars on Spotify, five stars in a review on Apple or anywhere else where you can uh, leave such reviews. This podcast took me five hours to make, but it would only take you five seconds to rate and review. And that's all from me. All the best. Take it easy. Cheers and ciao.